let's talk about English Bibles. And uh, the question that I want to begin with tonight, we're, tonight we're going to go right into English translations, but I want to begin with, uh, with just another way for you to be thinking about this. I, I want to tie this into something we're going to talk about later. I want you to imagine a homosexual friendly Bible. I want you to imagine a Bible, an English Bible, that is translated in such a way that the, the negative references to homosexuality are taken out. I want you to imagine a, a Bible translation, an English Bible translation that uh, does not condemn or uh, approves of transgenderism, transvestism. Or I want you to imagine one that does not condemn false religions like Islam or one that is feminist friendly where the Bible is the words are changed the words are rewritten so that the references to men are minimized and the, the terms referring to men are uh, expanded to, in, to include women or to be gender neutral I want you to imagine uh, that we're going to go through tonight we're going to talk about a lot of different things with English translations but when we end this all up I want to uh, talk to you about the, the real reality, what I expect to happen in English Bible translations as we move forward. And we'll see some, some frightening patterns that are already developing where English Bible translations are concerned. We sort of think that the Bible is off limits. If the Bible is the Bible and Satan's not going to touch the Bible. He's just going to try and get us not to obey the Bible. But if you were Satan, wouldn't you want to change the Bible too? So we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but I just want to lay that out there for you to be thinking about. Imagine such a thing, and I want to show you that it's not as far away as you think it is. In today's discussion, we want to really address three things. We want to first, I want to take you and give you some history of English Bibles, the actual history, the historical uh, Bibles that have come along that were translated into English, some of the significant figures that were involved in that. And then we want to talk about approaches to English translation. When we analyze all the different Bibles out there, what we're going to find is that there are several different ways that people approach translating, and those end up producing different kinds of Bibles. So I want to make sure you understand these three different translation approaches. And then we're going to talk about what Bible you should read, what Bibles, what English Bibles you should be reading. And that's where we're going to get into the conversation of some of the things that are going on that cause us, need to cause us to hit the pause button on just picking up any Bible that we find and assuming that it's a good Bible and just reading it and taking it, at it, taking it as it is written. So let's do that. Let's start a little bit with translation, English translation history. But let me go back here and just remind you of the process that we've already talked about, the four-step process of God getting us His Word. from We start off with God inspiring the original authors. You remember that? That's in our prior uh, message on this subject. He inspires, He moves the mind, that federal word from Greek. He moves the mind of the original authors. They write down their, uh, their thoughts onto paper. And then we go from there and copies are made in ancient um, Copies are made in the original language in Greek and, and handed out, spread out. That would, the Greek would be in the New Testament. Hebrew would be in the Old Testament. Those copies are made and uh, spread out so other people can read them. And then we have translations from those original languages into other languages, into uh, ancient languages of the past. We talked about Coptic, Latin, uh, those kinds of languages that the early uh, Bibles, the early New Testament in particular, were translated into. And that's where we stopped the last time that we we discussed this. We stopped at the translations into ancient languages. And I remind you that we talked about something that's very important. We talked about the twofold uh, structure of language. You remember that? Very, very important thing to understand in terms of translation. We talked about the surface structure of language, like, at, like the top of the water, the boat floating on top of the water, and that is the, the words themselves. I think you have a nice car, or you have a, a cool car. Uh, then you have the deep structure. The deep structure is the meaning. And these are the thoughts that we're trying to communicate through the use of words. So if I said, that's a, that's a cool car, what I mean is I like your car. It's, it, you know, and I could use other words to describe that. But that's the thought that I'm trying to get out. And when we're communicating, we're really not communicating words. 
we're communicating thoughts, ideas, mental constructs. And the way that I uh, told you that you could be sure of that is if you've ever tried to say something to someone and then you paused and said, how do I say this? So you're recognizing that there's a thought in your mind that you're trying to put into words, but you can't quite do it. Well, this is the basis of translation. This is why we can do translation, because we are taking uh, the words from the original language, the surface structure, we are understanding the meaning, that's the deep structure, and then we're taking that meaning and we're putting it into new words, into the new language. That's the basis of translation. That's why translation can work. But tonight we want to talk about English translations. We want to jump into this section of translations that have to do with the language that we speak. And in fact, many people in the world, as you know, speak. So we're going to cover a period from 1382 to 1610. Let's start with this. In 1382, there was the Wycliffe Bible. The Wycliffe Bible. This was translated by a man named John Wycliffe. And he was an English Catholic priest. Uh, he was a Catholic and he was a priest. And he had his doctor in theology from Oxford. And he translated the Bible into English in 1382. Now he was the only one that did the translation. It was a committee of one translating into English. And the key things about him were, in this, in this Wycliffe translation, was that he did not translate from the uh, uh, manuscripts, the original manuscripts of uh, Greek and Aramaic and, and Hebrew. He used what was known as the Latin Vulgate, uh, uh, which was the Latin Bible of the Catholic Church. So he took, he took the Latin and he translated English from Latin. He didn't go back to the copies that were remaining of the New Testament from Greek or the Hebrew copies uh, of the Old Testament. He copied, he translated from another language. So his was sort of a copy of a copy. And it was the first Bible that was translated into English, uh, in, into any modern European language. For a long time, the Catholic Church had such a uh, stronghold on, on Christianity, and they had a stronghold on the Bible, and they declared that only the Latin Bible was what we could be read in the churches. And it's also important to remember that this was before the Reformation, and this is before the printing press, which happened a little bit later. We'll get into a Bible that was uh, translated after the printing press here in just a moment. So that's the first major one, the Wycliffe Bible. And then we move on to the Tyndale Bible in 1534. 1534, the Tyndale Bible, William Tyndale. Now a few interesting things about this translation. First of all, it was done after the Reformation. The Reformation was in 1517, so this, this Bible was translated after that uh, historic event in Catholic and Protestant history. And he traveled to, to Germany. It's interesting, uh, we, you know, when I was studying this and, and uh, learning this, it, was, it sort of surprised me. We take for granted today that you can just print the Bible anytime you want to. You can buy a copy anytime you want to. But in 1408, there was a British law that forbid or forbade you having an English Bible at all. So you could not have an English Bible. You couldn't try and copy it. You couldn't try and print it up, uh, anything. Now, he didn't know Hebrew, and there were no Hebrew scholars in England, so he went to Germany where he could find some Hebrew scholars. Remember, Hebrew was the language of the Old Testament. He wanted to translate the whole Bible. So he translated the New Testament in 1525, and it's uh, fascinating, some of the words that we're so familiar with, he actually coined. He coined the word Passover. He coined the word peacemaker. Remember Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He coined the word scapegoat in this Bible. And the adjective beautiful. These all come from William Tyndale. Now, he did not get through the Old Testament. He only finished, he got the New Testament done, and he got through Second Chronicles in the Old Testament. Then he was kidnapped in 1535, a year after this Bible was published, and burned at the stake. Burned at the stake for translating a Bible into English. It was the first translation to use italics for words not in the original language. Now you'll notice you don't see this in all translations anymore. But in the King James in particular, if you, if you look at the translation, the actual English words, you'll see that some of those words are in italics. And those italicized words, we're going to talk more about translation approaches in a few moments, those are words that, do not ex that 
are not directly from the Greek or Hebrew. They are English words that are added in so that it will flow and make sense. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But he used those italic uh, words. He put he italicized the text anywhere that he wasn't going from a, a particular Greek or Hebrew word into English. So that was he was the first one to do that. The third major translation we want to talk about is the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible. And here are some pictures of it. You can see it's pretty curious looking, especially the type of font they used and the letters that they used. But the Geneva Bible, what had happened was uh, Mary Tudor became the uh, Queen of England in 1553 and she moved the nation back to Catholicism. And so a lot of uh, Protestants, uh, non-Catholics, those who were pulling away from the Catholic Church, they moved to Switzerland, to Geneva, Switzerland, where there was a guy named John Calvin. And so they all left, many of those left to flee, pers uh, to flee persecution and met up with John Calvin, who was a Protestant reformer in Geneva, Switzerland. And they accomplished a translation there. And there are a lot of firsts in the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible is a very uh, popular, very, very famous translation of the Bible. The first, it was the first to translate entirely from the original Hebrew and Greek. In other words, remember we talked about uh, one of the earlier Bibles being uh, translated from Latin, okay, from Latin. This one wasn't translated from Latin. This was, they went back to the original Greek manuscripts that were left. We talked about those last time. Or the Hebrew manuscripts that were left and translated directly from there. It was the first Bible that was done by a committee or a group of men and not just a single person. Remember, Tyndale was a single uh, translator and so on. It was also the first Bible with verse divisions. So this is the 1500s, and we've got the first Bible with verse divisions. You imagine how difficult it would be to preach when you couldn't say, turn to such and such a verse. You would, you know, turn to the middle of this page and look 12 lines down the third word in. You know, it would be really, really hard. So that was the first translation to do that. And this is a very popular Bible. As I said, historically, the pilgrims used this. This is the Bible that Shakespeare would have used. And another key about the Geneva Bible is that it was Protestant in its notes. In other words, a lot of the early translations, they would add notes, sort of like study Bibles, in fact, early on to help explain the passages to the people. And so this being, of course, done by a bunch of reformers, has a lot of Protestant reformed type of notes in it. So that's Geneva, the Geneva. And then we have the, the final uh, major uh, English translation before the King James, and that's the Bishop's Bible. So what happened here was the Geneva had become very popular among the pew sitters, among the people, the common people in their homes. These, this was the Bible that they wanted to use and that they read. It was very popular among the laity or just the average run-of-the-mill believer. Well, of course, the, uh, the Catholics didn't like that. They didn't like the Geneva Bible because it had so many Protestant notes in it. So they decided that they needed to, to translate a Bible that could compete with the Geneva. And so uh, they translated what's called the Bishop's Bible. And the Bishop's Bible was translated in 1568, but it never caught on. It was the one that was used in the churches during that time, but it wasn't one that the people liked, and it was last printed in 1606. So here we have sort of, we're going to set the stage now as we transition into the discussion of the King James. We have this situation in England where you have the church leaders, the church, the powerful church leaders who want the Bishop's Bible. And you've got the run-of-the-mill believer who wants the Geneva Bible. And so you've got this sort of struggle here between which Bible? because the Geneva notes were very dangerous for Catholicism because they were telling the people what the scriptures actually said, not just what the church said about the scriptures. So it was very dangerous for the church to have the Geneva Bible. So they needed a Bible that the people were going to like that didn't have all the notes in it that led everybody to Calvin and Calvinism and Protestantism and all of that stuff that was going on. And this set the stage for the King James translation. So let's go in and let's talk about the King James here a little bit. Here's a picture of King James. Ugly fella, I might have to say. 
But all these pictures are ugly of these old, these old paintings. I don't know what these guys were doing. At least make the guy sort of handsome. Look at that nose. Anyway, sorry. Um, Queen Elizabeth, who returned the, uh, the nation to Catholicism, she, she died in 1603, and she was uh, replaced by a guy named James VI of Scotland. And he became James I of England. So he was a Scottish. He probably uh, talked like Sean Connery. But at any rate, uh, one of the first things that he did was he called a conference in 1604, which is known as the Hampton Court Conference. And it was a, a conference where they were going to talk about various church issues. And one of the, the most significant things that happened was they decided in that meeting that they wanted to develop a new translation of the Bible. And here is an, the actual text of the Hampton Court Resolution regarding setting up and uh, translating a new Bible. Here's, here's what they said coming out of this. The Hampton Court Resolution. That a translation be made of the whole Bible as consistent as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, and this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes and only to be used in all churches of England in time of divine service. So you can see here sort of the history coming out in this resolution. They're saying, look, we need a whole Bible. Uh, we're going to go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. That's, that's following after uh, the uh, Geneva Bible. They wanted to have that as a point of reference to say, look, this is from the original Hebrew and Greek as well. And then it says no marginal notes. In other words, they don't want any notes that are going to lead the people away from the Church of England into this Protestant Reformation thing. So this becomes the basis, the basic uh, historical uh, justification for the King James translation. And of course, the final version that we have is the King James Version. The King James was done not by King James. It's important to note, it may, it may seem to go without saying, but King James did not translate the Bible. What happened was he appointed uh, six panels of scholars that totaled 47 men, and they worked on translating these different parts of the Bible. And it was published in 1611 with 8,500 notes. Those notes really didn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, like the Geneva, Protestant types of notes. Uh, they were notes about uh, different uh, ways to translate words from those original Greek and Hebrew. And in about 50 years, it had replaced the Geneva. So uh, the Church of England and James, they had, were able to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. So it's very important to understand the history of the King James Version. That it comes out of the Church of England, which not, none of us believe in. They didn't like Protestantism, but all of us are Protestants. So you just have to keep that in mind, uh, that we don't worship the King James Version, because it too comes out of historical context, and there are things about it that are not perfect. But one of the things that's, I think, most significant about the King James, the King James is a wonderful translation. It's an excellent translation. If you use the King James Version, keep using it. So this is not a, this is not a shot at the King James. But one of the things that's uh, helpful about dealing with this issue of King James only and that whole debate, it doesn't go on as much now as it used to, but there are still folks who, who struggle with that is that the translators themselves did not believe that they had produced a perfect translation. In, uh, they don't have them always now, but in some versions of the King James, and certainly in the original versions, there were notes in the, in the beginning of that Bible, not notes, a uh, uh, letter essentially from the translators, where the translators said, hey, this is what we're doing, this is why we did it, and this is what we're thinking, and this is how you need to view this translation. They, they actually set out and, and had a lot of comments, uh, pages of comments, before the actual translation began. Now, there's a couple of places in there I want to read to you. This is a message from the translators of King James, the original translators, that, that team of 47 men. So let's read what the, the translators say and see what we can learn from this as we think about English translations. The translator said, To those who point out defects in the translator's work, they answer that perfection is never attainable by man, but the word of God may be recognized in the very meanest or, or uh, most basic translation of the Bible. We're going to come back to that phrase. That's a very good way to state this. Just as the king's speech addressed to parliament remains the king's speech when translated into other languages than that in which it was spoken. 
even if it be not translated word for word, and even if some of the renderings are capable of improvement. To those who complain that the translators have introduced so many changes in relation to the older English version, and they're talking, probably talking about bishops in Geneva and so on, they answer by expressing surprise that revision and correction should be imputed as false. The whole history of Bible translation in any language, they say, is a history of repeated revision and correction. The translators here really hit on some very uh, key pegs in our understanding of translating the Bible. What, what we tend to think of in, in Western culture, in American culture, in Christian culture, is that we're going to end, that some Bibles are perfect translations in every way, shape, and form, and some are not. And therefore, the ones that are not must be discarded completely because they're not absolutely, positively perfect in every sense. Look at what these men are saying. These men are saying that. You, uh, let's look at this first one. Perfection is never attainable by man. In other words, we're going to do our level best under God to take that original Greek and turn it into English and communicate that deep structure the absolute best we can. But we may end up off here or there in minor ways. That is to be expected. But the Word of God, they go on, may be recognized in the very meanest, or they don't mean mean like in uh, he's mean, he's ugly, he's, he's harsh. They mean base, basic. The most, most basic translation of the Bible, God's Word is still there. So when we look at all these English translations, now, I'm going to make the case that there are some better than others and that there are things we need to be looking out for and not just wholeheartedly swallow hook, line, and sinker everybody that comes out with a new Bible translation. But at the same time, when we step back, what these guys are saying is the God's Word is represented in all of these English translations to some degree or another, and none of them is absolutely, positively, without question, perfect in every single sense. And they go on to say here, they're surprised that revision and correction should be imputed as false. In other words, as I said last time, we're going to have to continue to translate as we move through time. We, the English language is changing under our feet right now. So we will have to continue to translate the Bible moving into the future. English will change. We need to go into new uh, regions of the world and new dialects and new translations and all of that. But correcting and uh, revising is not a fault. It is what we ought to be doing to continue to try and get as close to God's Word as we can. But again, that does not mean that we put blinders on we cover our, cover our uh, you know, ears, eyes, and hear no evil, see no evil, you know, speak no evil kind of foolishness. We do have to pay attention, but we are not to just wholeheartedly go out and look for a perfect translation and then throw everyone else out and say, hey, these aren't the Bible at all. These don't represent God's Word at all. That is what these guys are getting at. So after the English, uh, after the King James Version, we have a number of versions. We're not going to go into these in any detail. We have the Revised Version in 1881. We have the American Standard Version in 1901. All these are sort of uh, playing off of the King James. You have the New American Standard Bible, uh, revised a number of times up until 1995, I believe is the last. The New English, the NIV is uh, 1973 and 78. But it is also, and I'll show you something very curious and concerning about the NIV uh, from the 2011 revision as we move on. That's one of the things that sort of set me off in realizing that we got to watch out with these translations. And I have more to say about that. And the New King James, which is what I use. Holman Christian Standard, which is a Southern Baptist uh, version. We have the message, we have the New Jerusalem Bible. I mean, you know, just we probably have 50, I don't know, 50 or more English translations of the Bible at this point. So let's, let's transition now. We, we've got all these Bibles. We've, we've listed some of them. We've looked at some of the history. Before we go in and look and say, hey, we need to be looking at reading these kinds of Bibles and you need to be watching and being careful about these kinds of Bibles and that kind of thing, 
let's talk about the different approaches to translation. When, when a team of men uh, sit down to translate from the original Hebrew and Greek, how, how, what rules are they following? What, what strategies are they following? How are they approaching this? Because what we're going to find is there are three, and those three are producing different kinds of translations and different kinds of Bibles. So let's go and let's talk about those three. First of all, we know that there was the original that was written. The original was written, and then there were copies made. We call those manuscripts, remember, in the uh, original languages, the Hebrew and the Greek, primarily in Aramaic as well. Remember that? But we know that we do not have the originals anymore. So we have all we have are manuscripts. So in the case of the New Testament, let me just step back here and make sure you understand this. In the case of the New, excuse me, in case of the New Testament, what we're doing is we're taking those manuscripts and we're trying to determine from those all those different Greek copies what what is the one Greek New Testament that we can pull out of all those copies. Every word that we study, every line, what is the best Greek to pull from that and pull from this and pull from this to give us what we call the Greek New Testament. And then from the Greek New Testament, then translations are done, accomplished in English. So in broad terms, this is how translation is done. We have a couple of different Greek New Testament um, uh, that are floating around that people use, that they refer to. And those are constantly being updated based on these manuscripts that they find and f further studies that they do and so on. So the, pr the, transition, the translation process begins with manuscripts and then those manuscripts are used to develop what we say is a, a formal Greek New Testament that we can say, hey, look, this is what we think the actual New Testament said in the original Greek. And then from there, Folks take that and they translate into new uh, types of new types of Bibles, new types of English translations. But in that process here, from going from the Greek New Testament to the English translation, for example, and with the New Testament, there are three ways that it is done. First of all, there is what we call the literal or word for word approach. This means that we're going to stick with the New Testament as our example. This means that the translator is taking a single word in Greek looking at that Greek word and saying, what is the best way to translate that word into English? I want to do as best I can to go word for word. Now, you cannot always do that, but their goal is to stay as close to it as possible a word for word translation. I'll show you what Bibles fall into these categories later. And as you move to the right here, you have what's called a dynamic equivalent. Now, a dynamic equivalent is not focusing just on the words. The dynamic equivalent is focusing on the thoughts. So the dynamic equivalent is, is working more from that uh, uh, deep structure and trying to translate that deep structure into English words uh, from a thought-for-thought -thought basis. They're not as focused on e individual words. They are sp spreading the... the uh, the purview a little bit and looking at thoughts. And then we have what we call paraphrases. Paraphrases are even farther back. They're going, look, we're not really worried about the word for word. We're not even trying to be a, a, a dynamic type equivalent, staying close to word for word, but spreading our wings a little bit. We're just going to go idea for idea. And a paraphrase is just what it sounds like. It's uh, take, a, take a sentence, and I try and say, well, what is this guy saying? And then I repeat it in as basic plain language as I can repeat it. Those are the three approaches to translation. And the most important thing I think for you to know about this, none of these are wrong in and of themselves, none of them are evil, but I think the most important thing for you to get out of this is that the farther you move from the left, from literal, the farther you move to the right, the more the translator's beliefs have to enter into the translation. Because remember, we're not going from word to word now. We're not trying to find the word and replace it with a word and then make sure it makes sense. We're not doing that. Now we're in internalizing and saying, what does this mean? The dynamic equivalent, what is the thought here? The paraphrase, what's the idea here? So what has to, what, as we move to the right, we end up with more and more of the translator's ideas, their beliefs, their convictions, entering into 
what is presented to us as the Word of God. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that that means they're all useless. I'm just saying, to me, that's a concerning thing, and that's something that you need to keep in mind. So let me help you understand now what some examples of versions that fall under these different types of translation approaches. The literal, we have the literal here. We have the thought for thought. We have the idea for idea. Let's look at this. And this is based on the United Bible Society's analysis. This isn't mine. So under the literal, you'll have the King James Version, the New King. And this isn't, this isn't uh, ex exhaustive. In other words, there are others that fall under this. I'm just giving you some representative ideas based on some that you probably recognized. New American Standard, English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard, those would fall into literal. And you can see in the green here, we're moving, as we go left to right, we're moving more towards the thought for thought or dynamic equivalent type, but still falling under the literal translation. And then we have the thought for thought. We have the NIV, which is just over the line there from literal. We have a, something called a New English Translation. We have today's NIV. It's important to know that there are a number of different types of NIV Bibles, and they're not all trying to accomplish or using the same approach. Some of them are more moving more towards the paraphrase than others. And then we have something called the New English Bible. Those are examples of thought for thought. And then we have some that fall under the idea for idea or the paraphrase. The Jerusalem Bible, the Message, the Living Bible. These are examples of Bibles that fall under those uh, that category of paraphrase. So let me give you some examples here. Just going to use two, two examples of uh, verses that are translated in each of these three columns. We'll have the literal on the left, the dynamic equivalent in the middle, and the paraphrase on the right. We'll use the New King James as a literal. We'll use the NIV as the dynamic equivalent, and then we'll use the Living Bible as the paraphrase. So let's look at Romans 1.18. And just notice uh, the differences here. Romans 1.18 in the New King James. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I want to highlight this phrase here, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now keeping in mind that with a literal translation, the translators are trying to go as close as they can to word for word and still, and still create a translation that you can read and, and you can understand. All right? The dynamic equivalent is very close to this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So here we have a very, very similar, uh, very similar words to the uh, literal translation, some differences there. And then we have the paraphrase. But God shows His anger from the Living Bible. But God shows His anger from heaven against all sinful, evil men who push away the truth from them. Now, <clears throat> the, the purpose of this really isn't to, you know, you could sit here and you could pick apart any translation that you wanted. You could find a verse here and a verse there that didn't seem right or somebody's going to criticize. But I'm going to make a case a little bit later against paraphrases. And I want to use this as an example. The word suppress shows up in both the literal and dynamic equivalent. Suppress the truth and unrighteousness, suppress the truth by their wickedness. But this paraphrase says push away. Now, the word uh, suppress in Greek means to hold back, detain, or retain. So when we look at the word suppress, that, uh, the English word suppress, uh, that fits. That, that, is a, that is a correct representation of the idea of holding back, detaining, or retaining. But when you get to the paraphrase, you've got push away. The idea that the I think God is communicating there through Paul is that it's not just that evil people push away the truth with unrighteousness. They sit on it. They push it down, suppress it, try and hold it back. Their wickedness is a cage for the truth. It's not that you're just pushing it away and, and, and kind of just nonchalantly pushing it aside. I don't really want to deal with that. It's that they're actively, through their wickedness, suppressing, retaining, holding back God's truth. You see, there's a difference there. There's a difference. And so I wanted to point that out to you. As we move farther to the right, you see the, the translator has to get more involved in picking words that meet with what he thinks that verse means. Let's do one more. Hebrews 11:7. 7. 
Hebrews 11.7. Let's look at the New King James literal translation. It says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So remember, we're going word for word, trying to get every word as close as we can to what was originally written in Greek. Now let's look at the dynamic equivalent. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So we, hear this, we have this phrase that I've highlighted, condemned, condemned the world, that shows up in both of those translations. It is worth noting, though, that uh, the dynamic equivalent says that Noah, by his faith, condemned the world. But uh, the literal translation says that he, it was the preparing of the ark that condemned the world, not his faith. Just a subtle little, see what, I'm, what I mean? You, get, you start moving from the literal, and you have to start figuring out what you think it means and writing that down. But the point that I want to make to you is that these are God's words. He has chosen each word for a reason. Hold on to that thought. But let's look at the paraphrase here. This is, a, this is surprising here. The paraphrase says, Noah was another who trusted God. When he heard God's warning about the future, Noah believed him even though there was uh, then no sign of a flood. And wasting no time, he built the ark and saved his family. Noah's belief in God was in direct contrast to the sin and disbelief of the rest of the world, which refused to obey, and because of his faith, he became one of those whom God has accepted. Do you notice what's missing? There's no condemnation here of the world spoken of regarding Noah and the ark. Again, not trying to pick nits, but just showing you that the farther you go to the right, you can have things start to be pulled out that if you don't, if you're just reading a paraphrase, you wouldn't notice. Uh, so I want you to, to see, to see that. So why, before we move into talking about what, what we draw from this in terms of Bibles that we should read or not read, why so many English translations, especially in the last all oh, 50 years? Why are there so many English translations? There are a number of reasons. Some of them are legitimate and some of them are concerning. Let's just hit these very briefly. One of the reasons we have so many new translations is that there have been manuscripts that were found, especially in the middle of the 20th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls in particular, that helped to enlighten us and helped us to uh, determine better, uh, better New Testament, better Old Testament uh, uh, manuscripts, you know, the, the, the better uh, Greek New Testament to translate from. So we, we, we wanted to do new translations because we had some new manuscripts. So we wanted to see, you know, translate from those. And uh, that's not a bad thing. Easier reading was another reason. There's been a move in the United States. I guess it goes with the whole culture to make everything easy. It's, uh, you know, Americans today are very soft people. We're, uh, we're a very weak people, a very wimpy people, a very whiny people, and we want everything to be easy. We want everything to be microwavable. We want everything to be DoorDash. And so the uh, publishers have responded to that with Bibles that, in their mind, are easier to read. This is one of the main drivers behind the dynamic equivalent and behind the uh, paraphrase versions. Now, I'm not saying that that's all bad. You know, we should be trying when we translate to make it so that we can read them and understand the, the Bibles that we, that we have. But I think the, the number of different translations and the move to a paraphrase is just indicative of the culture wanting things to be easier, which also ties into the seeker movement. The seeker movement, we want, we want people to be able to come in and read the Bible and get everything about it in three minutes. You know, we don't want them to have to struggle or, or, or wrestle with God's truth or learn or grow because people don't want to do that. They're not going to want to do that. They want to be spoon-fed. And uh, the Bible talked about that. You remember Paul talked about that in, uh, I believe it was 2 Timothy. He said that they were going to 
They were going to have itching ears. They were going to turn their ears away from the truth and turn them on the fables. They don't, they don't want to hear the truth. So we have this, this part of our culture manifesting itself also. Sales revenue. Look it up. One of the most... The, the, the best-selling book of all time, usually the best-selling book every single year in the United States, is the Bible. There's a lot of money to be made in the Bible in publishing new versions. If you publish a new version, and this is where we're going to get into some of the trouble here in a moment, when uh, these publishers spend the time and the money to translate, they then own the copyright to that work. And so they have to be, they, they earn additional revenue. People want to print it. They have to pay them royalties to do it. And I'm not saying that all publishers who publish a new Bible are bad. I'm not saying that profit is bad. I'm not saying that uh, having a business and trying to earn an income is bad. I'm not saying that. But what I'm suggesting is that there are things pushing translations that are not actually beginning with what's in the best interest of the kingdom of God. You have to keep these things in mind. And then finally, and this is one I've added most recently, in fact, because I've, I have seen it begin to take shape. And I want to show you an example here in a moment. Is the liberal agenda. You, you have to understand that the vast majority of Christians in America are liberal. They do not believe homosexuality is wrong. They do not believe that Muslims go to hell. They do not believe that Jesus is the only way. They are a cultural Christianity, a pop Christianity that I call it, which is a false and a fake Christianity. But unfortunately, they make up most of the Christians. So when you combine these things, when you see that publishers are looking to sell Bibles, and then we have people, Christian people, who are the consumers, the buyers, are becoming more and more liberal. When we see the pressure for Christians to begin to conform to the world's view of all of these different subjects, then we should expect, moving forward, Bible translations or revisions of translations that we trust to become more liberal in their translation. Now let me show you an example here from the NIV. I preached out of the NIV for a season. Uh, I, I, I like the NIV, but I've come to have some concerns about it, and I want to use this as an illustration. I had to... Uh, my NIV I bought in probably 06, give or take. So I was under the old, I believe it was 1980, 1978, 1980, 84. I forget exactly when the first NIV was translated, the, the translation version. But uh, I was teaching out of Malachi 4.6. We're going to look at that here in just a moment. And uh, we we're doing a Bible study. And I believe it was my wife. She had an NIV that was purchased more recently. And she said, that's not what my translation says. And I thought, really? We both have the same version. What's going on here? Let me show you the version. Let me tell you why I'm concerned about this. The 1984 uh, NIV, Malachi 4.6, speaking of the Messiah, says, He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, that's the way the King James translates it. That's the way the NASB, the English Standard Version, all you know, almost all those uh, older versions translate this as fathers. But what she showed me was that in her Bible, in her version of the NIV, it had that he will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents. Now, I know that there will be some people sitting out there thinking, what, what's the big deal, Wes? What's the problem? Well, the problem is the feminization of the entire culture. The pressure being brought to bear for us to give in to feminism and pull out these references to men in the Bible. Feminists hate the Bible. They hate the Bible because God is a man, <laughs> a male. Jesus is a man. And, and the Bible makes the man the head of the household. We've gone through that extensively in the previous weeks of these Facebook Live sessions. That God made the man and the woman, um, the man is the template, and then the woman is made off of the man and she is the helper of the man. We talked about how that does not de de denigrate her at all. It, it's her glory that she has been made this magnificent helper of this other magnificent creature called a man. But this word has been changed from the 84 edition to the 2011 edition from fathers to parents. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the Greek. 
or to the Hebrew, and let's look at what this word means. This word that's translated fathers or parents here from 84 to 2011 means father of an individual, of God as father of his people, head or founder of a household, group, family, or clan, ancestor, grandfather, forefather. There's just absolutely no room in that Hebrew word for parents. He's not talking about the parents there. He's talking about the fathers. And over in Ephesians, Paul says that the fathers are to raise their children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. The father is responsible. You see that? So what I'm asking is, why did they change it? If that word means father in every kind of way it could possibly mean father, what motive would a publisher, this is Zondervan, they're monstrous, have to change that word? Feminism. They don't like the word. Their customers don't like the word. They feel like the culture is turning against that word, so they are going to change it, but they don't say a word about it. You and I just pick up the NIV because we bought it 20 years ago, and we read it now, and all of a sudden, references to fathers are starting to be weeded out. My friends, look out. Look out for homosexual friendly translations. It only makes sense. We're already seeing it here in feminism. Now 25 years ago people thought we would never have homosexual marriage and now we have it. One little step at a time they take the things they want. And this is indicative of the problem here. They are moving now, Satan is moving into the Word of God itself to change it so that in the future in the United States of America there will be Christians who will open up the Bible and say you are wrong Wes Moore for teaching that homosexuality is wrong because this is what the Bible says and there will be Christians who persecute other Christians in the United States of America because of what the translation that they hold in their hand says and they will believe they are right because they are looking at God's Word. There will be transgender friendly Bibles. There will be Bibles who are less harsh on false uh, religions. Look out. So what does this mean? What Bible should I read? All right, here are my recommendations. Take them, take them or leave them. But here they are, based on what I've taught you. I recommend you stick with a solid literal translation. I have never found literal translations so difficult to read. That's kind of the argument that's made for uh, the dynamic equivalent. I've never found them to be so hard to read. These are God's words that you're talking about here. You need to be looking at God's individual words and making up your own mind as to what they mean. If you're having trouble understanding the Bible when you read it, then get a study Bible. Don't change the, the translation that you're using, that you're reading to your family, that you're reading to your children. Don't do that. They need to learn and memorize and be reading word-for-word -word versions so that they can see God's own words. Uh, the John MacArthur Study Bible is the only one I recommend, and I think Pastor James would give a big thumbs up on that if he could. Avoid all paraphrases. The far right, if you've got a living Bible, if you've got a new Jerusalem Bible, if you've got anything that's a paraphrase, throw it away. I know that sounds pretty harsh, but I already showed you. You're getting too much of the translator's ideas into that, into that Bible. You just need to move on from it. And then finally, be careful of any new translations or any new revisions as I've shown you from the 2011 uh, NIV. Imagine what they would do today if they, when they uh, revise it again. What would they say today? You've got to be careful. So we've got to be paying attention. As Christianity becomes more liberal, we're going to have to pull back and stick with some of these older translations, these older versions that uh, publishers don't have the rights over to change in order to make sure that we're staying on track with what God has actually said in His Word.